All right, so yesterday we ended talking about sp3 hybridized orbitals, and let's briefly go back to this because we're going to talk more about orbital hybridization today. And we said in the case of methane, if we draw out the molecular orbital for that central carbon atom, it only has two unpaired electrons. That means we need to hybridize it and form an sp3 set. That way we can actually form four bonds to carbon. And then down here we said sp3 orbitals are literally a hybrid of that sphere shape and that dumbbell shape. And it kind of results in this oblong looking shape. Some people describe it as a balloon. It has a little end on the other side as well. So it's got 75% P character and 25% S character. We know that methane is going to be a tetrahedron, so we actually have to draw this out three-dimensionally. That's why we use dashes and wedges a lot of time. Um, just do your best whenever I ask you to draw something. I don't expect you guys to be artists. I know I definitely am not. But let's take a look at a three-dimensional model of this, too. I know a lot of you guys are looking at getting model kits, but there are also internet resources that you can use to draw out molecules as well. One is called Mole View. It'll give you a three-dimensional representation of whatever you drew. And so if you look at methane over here, you can see that if we rotate it, not everything is in one plane. And so we have to take that into account, and that's primarily due to Vesper theory, right? By organizing those hydrogens in that position, they're as far apart from one another as possible. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's go back to that. And there's one other point I wanted to hit on. If we look at the bond between that central carbon and the hydrogens, what type of bond is that? We know it's a single bond, but there's another term for a single bond. Sigma, Sigma bond, right? So if we look at this, this overlap of orbitals is referred to as a sigma bond. We use the Greek symbol oftentimes. And a sigma bond is always going to be a point on overlap of two different orbitals. So if we look at this, it's a point on overlap of an s orbital and one of those sp3 lobes coming off of the carbon, right? What's the other type of bond that we sometimes run into? Pi, Pi bonds, right? So most of you guys have seen that, and that's exactly where I wanted to get started today, was starting off with pi bonds. Let's take a look at a specific example. Let's try C2H4. This is good old-fashioned ethylene. That means that we've got a carbon that's bonded to a carbon. We've got four hydrogens coming off. And then what am I missing here? Double bond, right? Otherwise, those carbons would be positive. So we've got a double bond between these two carbons. All right. What I want us to do now is to look at one of these carbons and determine its hybridization. They're both the same. SP2, right? If we look at this carbon, just like with this problem, we would say that this is SP2 hybridized. What would its geometry be? Trigonal planar. Trigonal planar. And what would the angles be between all of the atoms here, more or less? 120. All right, so we've got a pretty good idea of what it looks like. Now what we need to do is kind of draw this using a molecular orbital picture. So let's draw a carbon atom on one side. And actually, let me center this a little bit. We've got a carbon atom here. We've got a carbon atom here. We've got a hydrogen over here that we know is hanging out. This hydrogen atom's over here. And I'll put this hydrogen over here and this hydrogen atom over here. So we know we've got sp2 lobes coming off of this carbon, right? So I'll do an sp2 lobe coming off this direction. And then we've got an sp2 lobe coming off. Oh, that's not a very good drawing. Let me try this again. There we go. So each of these are sp2 lobes. And they're going to overlap. And then we know we're missing two other sp2 lobes, kind of like we saw with boron. One of these sp2 lobes is going to be sticking back a little bit, so I'm going to do that kind of as a dash. We'll label that as sp2. 
And one of them is going to be kind of coming out of the page at us. So we're kind of going to do a side on view of ethylene here. So we've got sp2. What orbital do we need to consider? The extra p orbital. The extra p orbital, right? If we hybridize an sp2 system, we saw that we have a leftover p orbital on that problem of the day, right? And we said that that p orbital is going to be sticking where? Straight up and down, right? So the sp2 lobes kind of stick out like a clover. They're trigonal planar. And then we've got a p orbital sticking straight up and down through those, right? So let's draw our p orbital sticking straight up and straight down. We'll just label that as a p. Not too bad. All right, now we need to fill them in with electrons. We know that this carbon has one electron in each of the sp2 lobes. And if we think about it, carbon also has an electron in the p lobe. We'll come back to that in a second when we do the orbital hybridization. How about hydrogen? What's going on with hydrogen? What orbital does it have? 1s. The 1s, right? So we'll do a 1s orbital for this hydrogen. That should be more sphere-like. Let me move this in. So it's going to form a special bond with one of those sp2 lobes. What do we call these bonds? Sigma, Sigma bonds. Same thing down here. We have this hydrogen. It's an s orbital. We'll label that as s. And again, we're going to have one electron that forms a sigma bond. All right, now let's do the other carbon. We'll do this one a little faster because we know it's going to be essentially a mirror image of that other side. Shouldn't they be out at a different angle? Yeah, we'll take a look at that in a second. So I'm going to draw that sp2 lobe pointed back and the other one kind of pointed towards us. So each of these are sp2. And then we've got these hydrogens, let me move this closer, that we know is an s orbital. And we've got an electron here. So we're forming a sigma bond between the sp2 lobes coming off of each carbon. We've got an electron over here. Let me clean this up a little. An electron here. Each of these hydrogens has an electron that will be spin down, spin down. And so again, we've got a bunch of these point on overlaps that are all sigma bonds. And then, just like on the left hand side, we've got this leftover p orbital that's sticking straight up and straight down. Oop, let me make it a little skinnier. And over here, we've got an unpaired electron. What's going to occur between those p orbitals? Pi bond, right? So if we look at this, these p orbitals can actually cross talk to one another and we form a new pi bond. So let's try to draw this in our software program. That way we can get a better idea of what that looks like. So I'm going to pull up that MoleView software. If you have a model kit too, you can do it the old fashioned way with a model kit. So we'll take a look at this. And I'm just going to do a hydrogen here, change this to a carbon. I'll add on two more hydrogens. I'll delete this. Whoa, no, that didn't work. <laughs> All right, sorry. We'll clean this up really quick. There we go. Hydrogen, hydrogen, there, there. If you decide to use this software, it's got this little broom up here. That just means clean up. That looks a lot better. And then we go to 2D to 3D. We'll hit that, that'll make the 3D model. If you go over here, we can make this a little bigger. And then we can rotate it around using our mouse. If we look at it, you'll notice that everything is in the same plane, right? The reason for that, if we look back at our diagram that we just drew, is those p orbitals are essentially locking everything into planarity, right? If you had p orbitals that weren't lined up, so one was sticking out towards you and one was going up and down, they couldn't have electrons line up with one another and you wouldn't be able to form a pi bond, right? But by having them aligned, 
perpendicular to one another, that allows those electrons in those p orbitals to communicate, and you form a new pi bond. A pi bond is basically just that double bond that you see. The first bond that you see is a sigma bond. Every additional bond after that is going to be a pi bond. Does that make sense? Is this a fair amount of review? Yep. Yeah, that's a common misconception. So a pi bond, um, if you look at a double bond, a double bond has both a point on interaction that consists of a sigma bond and that perpendicular interaction of two p orbitals. So it's both a sigma and a pi. What do you think a triple bond might be? Sigma and two pi. Sigma and two pi. So even a triple bond has some sigma bond-like character in it. It's just that overlap of the sp2 orbitals or sp orbitals. Some lower level chemistry courses don't clarify that to the extent that we really get into. Yeah. All right, so now let's take a look at the hybridization a bit more. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw that energy ladder that we did before. We've got 1s down here. We've got 2s. And then we've got our 2p orbitals, right? Carbon we know has six electrons. So we'll fill this up. We'll go one, two, three, four, five, six. But we know in this case, we need to form four bonds. Or sorry, three bonds, right? We only have two unpaired electrons. We need one bond for each hydrogen coming off of that carbon, and then another bond for that other carbon, right? So what we need to do is we need to hybridize this, and we know it's going to be sp2. So we're going to mush these together. And we'll form our new energy ladder. This 1s orbital is unchanged. We formed a new hybrid set. It's going to be our sp2 lobes. This p orbital is left over, so we'll call that 2p. And then we need to fill this up, right? So let's fill it up. We know we've got six of them. So we go one, two, three, four, five. And then do I go six? Ah, this is a tricky thing. This throws a lot of people in organic chemistry, right? If we did this, we wouldn't have any electrons in our p orbital to do a pi bond. If we look back up at our drawing, we need an electron in that p orbital in order to do the pi bonding. So in this case, we're not following that principle where we fill up the lowest energy orbitals first. In this case, this 2p orbital is so close in energy that one of the electrons will actually occupy that 2p orbital. And that's what allows that pi bonding to occur. So this would be the overall molecular orbital diagram for each of the two carbons in ethylene. Let's try one more. We'll do the cousin to ethylene. We'll do acetylene. Does anybody do welding in here? No? Oh, man. So welding tanks are full of acetylene. It's usually an oxyacetylene tank. So if you ever see a welder, they're full of C2H2 and oxygen. So let's take a look at this. We've got two carbons. We've got two hydrogens. So I'll fill those in. We know that hydrogen can only form one bond to carbon. And what else do we need here? Triple bond, Triple bond right? We have to follow the octet rule with carbon. So the complete Lewis dot structure would be like this. All right, so now let's take a look at this carbon. What would the hybridization of this carbon be? SP. SP, right? If we look at the steric number, it's got a steric number of 2. Steric number of 2 is always going to be SP. So we'll label this as SP. And then what would the geometry be? Linear. I hope you guys all get linear, right? It's a pretty easy one. And then the angle, 180. <laughs> All right, now let's try to do our molecular orbital picture for this. A little bit more challenging. So we've got a carbon here. We've got a carbon here. We know it's got sp2 lobes. Those are going to participate in sigma bonds, right? 
So anytime we're looking at SP, SP2 or SP3, they're going to do the sigma bonds. So I'll have an SP like this, SP like this. And on the other side, 180 degrees away, we'll have another SP. And on this side, we'll have another SP. All right, we know in each of these SP orbitals, there's going to be one electron from each carbon. So one electron, one electron. The other carbon, same thing. We'll have one electron and one electron. All right, so those are our hybridized orbitals. What's left over? Hydrogen. hydrogen. Hydrogen, okay, so let's draw in our hydrogen. We know we'll have a hydrogen over here. We know we'll have a hydrogen over here. Each of these hydrogens has one electron that's hanging out in that s orbital. All right, are we done with the orbitals on carbon? No, if we look back up here, in this case we took that 2s orbital and we mushed it together with two of the 2p orbitals. If we're doing sp, we're only going to mush together the s orbital with one of the p orbitals. That leaves us with two p orbitals left over, right? So we've got to account for those p orbitals. So let's draw those in. And I'll do it kind of the same as before. I'll have this one sticking up and down, and this one sticking up and down. We'll call these our P's. And we know each of these, in order to form a pi bond, will have to have one electron. So this will form a new pi bond. Over here, we only have, whoops, sigma bonds. So that takes care of one of the p orbitals on the carbon that was not hybridized. What about the other one? Where do you think it might be going? In the plane of us. Yeah, if we think about Vesper theory, right? Electron clouds don't want to be close to one another, so we can't stick the p orbitals in the same plane. That means they're going to be in the opposite plane. So if you imagine a p orbital going directly in and out of the board, that would allow the electrons to be far away from one another. So I'll do my best artistic representation of this. So we'll have one p orbital kind of sticking back there. We'll shade this to kind of give it a little perspective. Call this our p, and then same thing over here. It's kind of sticking in and out of the board. And each of these will have one electron. And we'll form a second pi bond right here. So let's think about this for a second. Let's imagine trying to twist a triple bond. Do you think it'll be very easy to twist those two carbons? And rotate them? No, we've got a lot of p orbitals that are overlapping, preventing those two carbons from being able to twist, right? So these pi bonds provide a lot of rigidity anytime you have them occurring between two atoms. It kind of restricts the rotation of those atoms. What about the hydrogen and carbon? Can we rotate those very easily? Well, you could, but it, it still wanted to be the 180 degrees away. Yeah, think about a pi bond like this. We've got essentially locked pieces, a lot harder to twist. However, if we've got a point on interaction, a lot easier to twist that. So sigma bonds are easy to rotate. Pi bonds are not so easy to rotate. Were there any questions? Do you have one? Oh, I thought I saw your hand on. All right. So again, let's take a look at the molecular orbital picture for the sp hybridization case. So again, I'm going to do carbon down here. We've got our s orbitals and we've got our p orbitals. So we've got 1s, 2s, 2p. We know we've got six electrons. However, in this case, we're just hybridizing one of the S's with one of the P's because we know it's going to be SP hybridized based on its uh, geometry.
And this time we have two p orbitals left over. Just one second. We've got two of the two p orbitals left over. We've got now two of the sp orbitals that were hybridized. And then we've got this one s orbital hanging out down here. If we fill them up, the one s orbital gets filled. And then we've got four other electrons that we need to fill. So we go one, two, and then do I go three, four? No, we need electrons in the p orbitals, right? The electrons in the p orbitals allow the pi bonds to take place. So we end up occupying the sp orbitals with one electron and the 2p orbitals with one electron. I know we've kind of had it beaten into us that you need to fill all the lowest energy orbitals first. Again, when we hybridize in this case, we need to actually fill up our hybrid orbitals and then fill up those vacant orbitals if they're available. Say that again? If you choose to hybridize the 2s with the empty 2p orbital, you can just leave those other electrons in the p orbital and assume that they're not moving. So when you fill it up, you just. Oh, yeah, I guess you could also think of it that way. So you're saying, why pick that orbital? Why not just pick this orbital? <laughs> yeah, that's another way of looking at it, too. Yep. Good point. So let's take a look at each of these orbital pictures again. Again, we said that an sp3 hybridized orbital is essentially going to be a sphere plus 3p orbitals. Which we said gave us some sort of balloon animal shape. Actually, let me draw this a little bit clearer. There we go. We said that this is going to be our sp3 hybridized orbital. And if you remember, I said that sp3 lobes have 75% p character. They only have 25% s character. So they tend to be kind of oblong. Let's do the same thing with sp2. So sp2, we've got that s orbital. We've got two of our p orbitals. And in this case, do you think it's going to be more oblong or less oblong? Less oblong, less oblong right? It's got less p character to it. So if we think about it, this one will be a little bit stubbier. It's still somewhat oblong. Whoop, let's see if I can draw this. So if you notice, this one's going to be shorter. Another way of thinking of this is more S-like. Because in this case, it's only going to be 67% P character. So it's going to look a little bit more like a sphere. If we go down to SP, we just have one S, one P, and this makes it pretty squatty. And this one will be even shorter. Because now we only have 50% p character. So if we think about this, do you think a double bond will be shorter or longer than a triple bond? Well, let's go look at it, right? So the triple bond, we've got two sp lobes that we know are short connected to one another. That means that carbon-carbon bond and a triple bond is actually going to be pretty short when compared to the carbon-carbon double bond where we've got more oblong or longer sp2 lobes connecting them together. So this is a really good way to get a rough idea of um, relative lengths of carbon-carbon bonds, is you have to look at what hybrid orbitals are around that carbon.
Make sense? I know we're going through this pretty quick, um, but if you do have any questions, feel free to stop by my office and we can go over it in a little bit more detail. I do want to kind of change gears though, so we can finish up on time this week. We're going to talk about bond polarity and net dipoles. So there's a handful of different bonds that show up pretty commonly in organic chemistry. And let's make a list of them. The first one, I'll do an example. This is ethane. So C2H6. Do you think ethane is going to be polar or nonpolar? Non Probably nonpolar. I'm sure a lot of you remember from your Gen Chem classes that carbon hydrogen bonds aren't really that polar because they have similar electronegativity. So we would call this a nonpolar covalent bond. If we look at methanol, on the other hand, things change a little bit. What type of bonds occur in methanol? Hydrogen. hydrogen bonds. Another way of looking at this is a hydrogen bond is a unique type of polar bond, right? In fact, it's a very extreme type of polar bond. So when we would look at this, we would call this polar covalent, also H bonding. Specifically because that oxygen is very, very electronegative, it's going to want to hog all of the electron density around it. The last one we might want to look at is going to be NaCl. What would this be called? Ionic. So an ionic bond we know isn't going to be a sharing of electrons anymore. That chlorine is so much more electronegative than the sodium that it's just going to rip off the electron from sodium and take it as its own, which means that chlorine is going to have a formal charge of negative one and the sodium will be a positive one charge. A lot of times people get stuck thinking of these as black and white situations when in reality it's not. It's a, sh it's a bunch of shades of gray, excuse me. And if we think about this, we can use this table and if you just Google electronegativity table, you'll see something like this. If you open up your Gen Chem textbook, you'll probably see something similar. If you notice, the general trend for electronegativity is as we go up towards fluorine, things tend to get more electronegative, right? So the halogens are very electronegative, oxygen is very electronegative, nitrogen is pretty electronegative. And then once we get further away from that, we're dealing with uh, atoms that don't really pull electrons that hard anymore. So what we do in order to classify bond types is we look at the dif difference in electronegativity. So we saw in the example of ethane, we had carbon and hydrogen, right? So let's go look at the table. Carbon has an electronegativity value of 2.5, hydrogen's 2.1, the difference is only 0.4, right? So organic chemists tend to classify nonpolar covalent bonds as bonds where you have a difference in electronegativity less than 0 0.5. So in the carbon-hydrogen case, we saw that was an example of 0 0.4. Let's do the same thing with methanol, right? So we've got carbon and oxygen. We look at carbon, it's 2.5, oxygen's 3.5. Now we've got a difference much greater than 0 0.5. In fact, it's uh, twice as much. So in polar covalent bonds, they typically have a difference in electronegativity of 0 0.5 to 1.7. Obviously, that leaves us with ionic bonds, where they typically have a difference in electronegativity that is more than 1.7. So if we go down again and we look at sodium and chlorine, 
pretty clear cut with sodium and chlorine. Sodium, we've got it down here, 0 0.9. Chlorine over here, we've got 3.0. Pretty big difference, that's 2.1. So that's a really easy way to classify bond types, and we can use that to determine whether or not a molecule is going to be polar or nonpolar too, right? So let's take a look at that. So differences in electronegativity result in a dipole. So let's take a look at the example of methanol. I'm going to draw it two different ways, and I want you guys to help me determine which one's the better way to draw methanol to. Why do you think the one on the left is better? Because the oxygen's lone pairs have about twice as much pushing on than a single bond would. Yeah, another way of looking at this is if we look at this oxygen, what's the hybridization? Ah, tricky. If we count the steric number, it's got two bonded atoms and then two sets of lone pairs, so it's a steric number of four. So it's going to be in that tetrahedral subgroup. We know it's going to be bent, but either way, it's going to be sp3 hybridized. So if we think about this lone pair, one of them is actually going to be sticking out, kind of in this cloud towards us, and the other one's going to be sticking away. And I'll move these just to kind of emphasize that. So with methanol, that hydrogen actually isn't in line with that carbon. It's actually cocked out a little bit. So we tend to draw that hydrogen sticking down, not sticking straight away. So I'm going to erase this one because I like the drawing on the left a lot more because it shows that bent character of that oxygen. All right, so now we know that oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. That's going to mean that this oxygen is hogging electron density from that carbon. Oftentimes, in order to show that, we use this arrow. And I'll show you guys what this arrow means. It has a single head on one side, and then on the other end, it's got a cross. That means the side with the cross is going to be more positive. And the side where the arrow is pointing is going to be more negative. These are just simply referred to as dipole arrows. It shows that that oxygen's pulling the electron density away from that carbon. Are there any other big dipoles in this molecule? Any oxygen. polar bonds? Oxygen and hydrogen. Yeah, oxygen and hydrogen. If we look at the difference in electronegativity between oxygen and hydrogen, it will be quite large. Again, we want the arrow pointing towards the oxygen, and we've got another dipole arrow there. Another way of showing this, instead of using the arrow designation, is to use another set of symbols. So let me redraw this. And you can do a delta negative, indicating that that oxygen has an excess amount of electron density. This hydrogen, on the other hand, had some of its electron density stolen, so that it will be a delta positive, and this carbon will be a delta positive. So you can use either or, I really don't care, whatever works best for you. So let's draw that down here. This means more positive, This one means more negative. All right, now let's take a look at some practice molecules. And this time I want us to identify individual dipoles. So identify pairs of atoms where one atom is a lot more electronegative than the neighboring atom, and then draw in the arrows or the delta symbols.
All right, so we've got a couple of them. I'll do B, F, three, and then we'll do N, H, three. So you may need to draw the Lewis dot structure and then work from there. Give you a hint too, geometry is important. Yeah, let's take a look at the electronegativity chart. So boron has a value of 2.0, fluorine's 4.0. I know that's supposed to be ionic, <laughs> but let's treat it as a covalent bond because it's kind of close. Like I said, it's a series of grays and there's some wiggle room in between them. If we look at nitrogen and hydrogen, that's a difference of 0.9. Is that going to be considered polar? Yeah, absolutely. Raise your hand if you think you got it already. A couple people. Yeah, let's do a picture. A picture is worth a thousand words. So BF3, what shape should it be? Trigonal planar, yeah, it's similar to boring, right? So we'll do BF3. We know we've got fluorine up here, has three lone pairs around it. We've got a fluorine over here, three lone pairs around it. And we've got a fluorine over here. What's more electronegative, boron or fluorine? Fluorine. fluorine. So we can say, all right. Do that, and we'll do that. Perfect. Not too bad. Let's do NH3. What's the shape going to be for NH3? Trigonal pyramidal. Ah, trigonal pyramidal, right? We have to remember that nitrogen in this case will have a lone pair coming off of it. So the nitrogen will have one hydrogen sticking down, the other one will be sticking down, the other one will be behind the board sticking down. Directly above it, though, we've got this lone pair just hanging out. It's really important to count all of your valence electrons or else you can forget that lone pair. What's going to be more electronegative, nitrogen or hydrogen? Hydrogen. Yeah, so we've got some dipoles here that are being pulled towards that nitrogen. All right, now a tricky question. Boron trifluoride, the one on the left, is nonpolar. Why? Because it's the dipoles cancel out. Yeah, so let's think about it this way. If you have a tug-of-war game with two guys or two ladies of equal strength and they're pulling, nobody's going to win, right? They'll equally pull. Nobody will get more electron density than the other. The same thing is true in boron trifluoride. You've got symmetry there. So each fluorine is pulling equally on each side of that boron and none of, neither of them, or none of them, none of them is pulling any uh, density closer to towards it than any of the other ones. So even though there are net or individual dipoles, there are no net dipole. What about ammonia? 
Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely polar because if we think about it, it's like a bar stool with three legs. That nitrogen is pulling electron density from each of those hydrogens. So that area above the nitrogen has a lot of electron density, right? So what we do oftentimes is we draw a net dipole arrow and we draw that in the direction of the overall dipole for the molecule. So there's two things we have to worry about. Individual dipoles between bonds and then net dipoles for the overall molecule. So this one has an overall net dipole, meaning there's high electron density on the lone pair side. All right, let's do, I think we've got enough time for one more practice. Let's do CH2Cl2. It's methylene chloride. What's up? Uh, I want you to draw the Lewis structure for CH2Cl2 and then determine if the overall molecule is polar. In this case, there's actually only one isomer. Yeah. yeah. You guys want me to show you the wrong way to do it so you don't do that first? Yeah. All right. <laughs> wrong way. A lot of students will say, all right, I'll put a chlorine right there. I'll put another chlorine right there. And we've got a hydrogen over here, a hydrogen over here. If I look at my electronegativity table, chlorine's more electronegative. So I'll say, all right, there's a dipole that way, dipole that way. They cancel out because those chlorines are on opposite sides, therefore methylene chloride is nonpolar. Can somebody prove me wrong? What do you think, Grace? It's just all about the angle you're looking at it. Because if, you, if you're doing this and, and you're looking at it like that, that's what it is. But truly, you can also turn it on its side. And it's not a very good explanation, but the two chlorines could also be considered to be on the one. Yeah, I, li I like the hand symbol. So if you think about the two chlorines, <laughs> they're on the same side, right? So in this case, they're gonna be pulling electron density towards one side of the molecule. So a better way of drawing dichloromethane would be to have one hydrogen there, one hydrogen there, maybe put one chlorine out as a wedge, the other one back as a dash. And now where is the net dipole pointing? Yeah, in between the two chlorines. So you can have a net dipole that points in between two atoms and that means that methylene chloride is polar overall. We just have to account for that geometry too. Geometry is very, very important. All right, I think we're gonna leave um, at that today. The problem of the day has a couple questions on dipoles and it asks you to draw that um, diagram showing how orbitals overlap. Try to label everything the best you can.